thanks very much. Lovely to be here. Let me just see if I can work this out and be cool, calm, and collect myself. Um, if you pay me enough money, I'll make sure that the, um, the wheels stay on the cars. Because <laughs> that's how we make money on Merseyside. <laughs> But um, this is really about, um, we've talked about real food, but hopefully this is about real life. And it's about, um, it's about something called emotions, really. And it's how we emotionally engage in lots of stuff, right? That brings about physiological consequences and changes the way we choose and stuff like that. So I'm sort of um, associated with all these different places here. I have a, a clinic in the local community where I help people to understand that by changing the way their body works, especially their heart, they can change the way their head works to change the choices they make. So really it's understanding and trying to help people to reconnect with their body, reconnect to the feelings and to change um, their feelings to make better, healthier choices. So it's really about real life and how we engage with things in life. But um, people ask me, what is a consultant in the integrative health practice? I just have to say, I'm not a doctor of medicine, but I'm a doctor in medicine. And all that means simply is that I've got a PhD in medicine, so therefore I'm a proper doctor. And um, this is my field, really, integrative medicine. It's really psycho neuro endocrino immuno hematology. <laughs> okay. And what it, what it really means in simple terms is that what goes on in your psychology sends signals to your nervous system. Are we okay with that so far? Okay. Now, how your thinking sends signals to your nervous system, right, that's a whole other talk. You know, probably last a lifetime to understand that bit. But it's how then the nervous system, dependent upon the signals from your mind, sends information and impulses to your endocrine glands or your endocrine glands. You know, and those endocrine glands secrete substances which then go into your biochemistry and into your hematology, into your blood, which impact then upon the cell surfaces of stem cells. And how they impact upon the stem cells will determine how your DNA expresses itself. Any questions so far? <laughs> so really, in a way, how we think and how we cognitively and emotionally process information will determine the nerve conduction to the endocrine glands and will end up in our blood systems which will impact upon stem cells. So, in a way, how we think becomes who we are. Does that make sense? And then the signals, those biochemical signals um, from the bloodstream send information then back to our psychology in the form of feelings. So this is all about feelings, you know. It's about human factors and really how can we help people that we're working with? How can we get them to understand their own internal operating systems? Because each of us is unique. We operate in completely different ways, you know, and it's trying to help people and go back and help them to change through breathing and through the use of emotion, how they can feel more settled in their minds and make clearer, healthier choices. So that's the simplicity of this really is. It's all about breathing. So I just point you, I can't get through, you know, I won't be able to go through all these slides because I've put too many, but um, I just point you to this Mindful Nation UK. There's loads and loads and loads of information. Mindfulness used to be considered to be woo-woo, whatever that means. But over the last 10 years, you know, um, over the last 10 years, there have been literally thousands of studies now lots of them neuroscientifically based to show that mindfulness works. So rather than going through them all now, there's a great um, booklet here I, I refer you back to. So what is mindfulness? It's basically non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. Well, what does that mean? And it basically just means to be with yourself. Just like this. <laughs> it's not to be thinking of what's coming up or what's gone before. It's to actually be present in the present moment. To pay attention and to be with who you're with, rather than going off and letting your mind take you away, really. So, how do we do that? Now, I've done this for a long time, and 
You know, mindfulness isn't a meditation practice. Mindfulness can actually lead you to meditation, and meditation can lead you to mindfulness. And by the way, if you go on a meditation course, and the instructor says to you on the first session, clear your minds, right? Get up and walk out, okay. Because mindfulness is, is not what you think. This is like the guru bit of me coming out there. Mindfulness is not what you think. It's more about how you feel. That's the way I explain it, you know. And I might be right and I might be wrong, but I would suggest that if you focus on feelings first, you've got more chance of clearing your mind and coming back to the present moment. Does that make some sort of sense? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so it's about taking notice, really, of what's going on where you're at, rather than sort of projecting into the future or going back into the past. And it's part of the five ways to well-being. This has been sort of promoted for a long time now. But you see here that to take notice, right, is here. This is where it starts, taking notice. And that's where mindfulness comes in. It's taking notice about what you're actually choosing in the present moment. So when people are stressed or a threat appears, what normally happens is we process that information as friend or foe. And if we come up with foe, or it's an enemy, we automatically and autonomically go into a defense arousal response. I'm sorry to use the scientific terms, but, you know. And that's called the fight or flight response. And when we're in fight or flight, we go into tension, right? And we come out of mindfulness and we just go straight into, I need to defend myself. And we emotionally engage. And most of that emotional engagement will take us back to habitual patterns that are deep down, right, in our psyche. And most of these patterns have been there since we were children. You know, so a lot of these sort of coping scripts that we developed as children, right, are still there, pretending to defend us, but not actually giving us any defense, just causing stress and tension and anxiety and energy usage. I've learned how to use the PowerPoint there, have you? <laughs> in fact, I'll go back again to Oh, there we are. <laughs> so, over the last decade especially, mindfulness has increased massively in popularity. So, what tends to happen is, more and more people are sort of looking for alternatives, or really looking backwards to try and find out when things are a bit calmer, a bit cooler, how did people remain or how is it that some people can remain cool, calm, and collected in this sort of very volatile and uncertain world that we live in? And if I was going to take, if there's one take-home message that has been said before many thousands of years ago, is just become aware of your breathing. I would just say that is because most of us and most of the people I see are so disconnected from their body, right, and so distracted by what's going on out there that if we become aware of our breathing and get better at it, then it brings us back to our body. It can bring us, it can help us to disengage from what's going on, take a step back, find some space to think again. And I think this morning's um, talks and sessions have been about um, making the right food choices. If we can take space to think again, whether this will be healthy or harmful, and we've got a better chance than going forward. That's my fear. So just put your hand up if you see it turning clockwise. So clockwise would be this one. Hands down if you see it going anti-clockwise. Okay. So two thirds of you approximately saw it going clockwise, and a third of you at the same time saw it going anti-clockwise. So let's do that again. Let's put your hand up if you see it going clockwise. Hands down, anti-clockwise. How can that be? Now, I know I'm from Merseyside, right, but I'm not here to cause trouble, right? Okay. But the point about it is, how can that be? And before you say it, she's changing. No, she's not changing. She isn't changing. Oh, yes, she is. Oh, no, she isn't. Right. So once again, clockwise. Hands down, anti-clockwise. Same, whoa. How's that happening? Let me explain. And before I go any further, I really believe that most of type 2 diabetes, I'm going to sort of throw a statement out here. I feel 
that most type 2 diabetes, the root cause of it is misperception. It's misperception leading to inappropriate emotional processing, leading to a defense arousal response, which leads to egocentric contraction. Everybody with me? <laughs> right? And that tension then causes us to seek for emotional seeking and comfort seeking behaviors. Okay, because if you eat a large amount of food, it automatically brings in the rest and digest response. You see what I mean? And that's why sometimes people are driven to eat food because it brings in a different way that their nervous system is working. So there's a lot of physiology involved in this. And I think stress, anxiety and depression are really, really big factors that lead to the way people behave. And that behavior then, and my feeling is, those stress responses and stress hormones then lead to um, activation of the, uh, the pancreas and stuff like that. So that's another story. So once again, just put your feet on the ground if you would. And then just listen to the sound of my voice. And what I want you to do is just very, very gently soften your gaze and just gaze at her ankles. And as you gaze at her ankles, just allow your breathing to come and go nice and gently all the way in. And importantly, all the way out. Make sure that you breathe it all the way out. And as you breathe out, just allow your shoulders to relax. Just gently breathe all the way in. Soften your gaze. Look at her ankles. And what might start to happen is she might start to change and start to go one way than the other. Is that happening? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just by a simple change in your in mood state and your breathing state, you have changed that your way that you're seeing this figure here. Right. Now let me try and explain the science of this. Right. That's only taken a couple of moments to do. If you actually use something like this, you can get this uh, free of charge on Google. If you put in, just type in the naked woman. No, don't put that. Um, you know, if you put in something like the woman that turns every which way or the other when you're looking at it, you can actually you can actually download the GIF file and you can use this as an aid to change the way that you see and perceive things. And what's actually happening is, right, light signals are coming in, so photons are coming in, they're hitting the back of our eye, that's then changing that information into an electrical signal. That electrical signal then will go down our optic nerve to our occipital cortex at the back. Now, depending upon whether those signals go to your right brain or your left brain will determine how you see the world, right? If you, if you are a right brain processor of visual information, then you'll see her going clockwise. If you're a left brain processor, you'll see her going anti-clockwise. So what? Well, it determines then how you see the world and how you make choices. If you're a right brain processor, that's supposed to be more inclined towards the feminine perspective of the human being. The holistic view, okay. If you're a left brain processor, that's more linear. Linear, logical, and very, very um, focused, okay. The idea is, if you want to really be balanced is, is to be able to see both alternatively, do you see what I mean? So, if you can just again, put your feet on the ground, soften your ankles, and as you go deep enough, what should happen is, if you practice this, you can see it going one way, then the other. If you can see it going one way or the other, and you stay there for any amount of time, Neuroscience is showing now that if you do it for a length of time, then your neural pathways change. And your neural pathways in your brain determine your behavior, you see. So this is how we can help patients. We can use physiology to change psychology, to change choices, to make healthier options and stuff like that. Does that make sense? So just by doing this. But as I say, you can get this free of charge. So it's a matter of perspective. So the next thing is, that perception and outcome, how you go, oh, by the way, it's important in relationships because if you're default to a right brain processor and you're living with somebody who's a left brain processor, you know, in arguments you can never see eye to eye, right? This is the whole point is, in stressful things you will default to your childhood responses 
and you will choose those coping strategies to try and get yourself out of the situation. Some people go forward, some people go backwards, do you see what I mean? So the whole point about it is, in order to get some balance, it will be helpful to know this and to be able to change your emotional responses to life. So there we are, there's some marriage counsel in there. <laughs> so, we see things, we perceive things, we interpret things. Right, but in stress, what tends to happen is, in stress, our physiology, our physiology changes quickly in order to defend us. One of the first things that happen is our heart rate speeds up, okay? So our heart rate speeds up, our blood pressure increases, but our breathing changes. And most of the time we go to rapid and shallow breathing to try and get more oxygen in. I didn't intend this to be sort of a lecture, but it's turning out to be more. <laughs> but um, then, the emotional reaction then will determine the feelings that emerge then. And the feelings that emerge will change our thinking, and the way we think then will change our behaviour. Now, modern medicine as it stands at the moment feels that if it can introduce some more cognitive techniques to change behaviour, then that will help people. So what we tend to do is, we try to put the same message across using more refined techniques. Are you with me? We will reframe it in a different way, but the message remains the same. I'm going to try and turn that on its head now because I think it's really important. And I'm going to say that if we can change our physiology and we can change our emotional state, our feelings are different, our thinking is different, and what emerges is we get a much more open-minded approach to making choices. So this is hacking physiology to change psychology. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's really turning everything on its head because does this work? Does using mindful breathing work to change people's behaviours? Right. The other thing is, when we try and change the cognitive side of things, we try and introduce more thinking, grit your teeth, yes you can, you can do it, you know all those like sort of boot camp <coughs> mentalities. And, you know, and we'll all do this together, you know. It brings in more tension, and that's why over the long term, people rebound to the old behavior. Most people don't realize that the patterns are in our, what's called the other than conscious part of our mind. They're in our deeper psyches, they're in our long term memory. You can't use that one there to get into that one there because that's much more powerful. That's where all the defense mechanisms lay. So that's the mind, and that's the body. And I think the body, in my opinion, the body is always sending signals out of how, how it's emotionally processing information. So, does it work? Quickly, just go through a quick case study. We, we picked a, an interesting case here. He, he was a hopeless case, male, alcoholic, and we talked about drinking. He was a heavy smoker as well, so we're trying to bring all those principles of healthy living in. Right. He's got severe mental and emotional difficulties, he's broke, right, he's on a second divorce, so he's obviously hasn't got that right brain left hemisphere thing going. Right, he's on numerous medications, chronic low back pain, stomach problems, depression, stress, anxiety, depression, all those things. He's got tension myositis syndrome, that just means that he's got chronic muscle tension, sometimes misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia and stuff like that, but all in the same mix of the right and he's got all sorts of infections in his body. We got some, um, some markers of his uh, physical state. Six foot tall, 17.3 stone, BMI, so he's obese. His blood pressure's up, but he wasn't actually um, treated for blood pressure. His heart rate's up, his fasting blood glucose six, six point one, so he's probably a pre-type two diabetes, and his mood was obviously low. But now, Using mindful breathing and deliberately developmental stress re-education, he's still the same height. <laughs> That's what truth is everybody. But he feels much taller. Okay. His weight's 95. So the other thing is, if you saw that his weight was 95 and you didn't know what his journey was, right, <laughs> then you might say, well, oh, that needs to go off, okay. But the point is, he's lost all that weight, right? His BMI's coming down, his weight's coming down, his blood pressure's coming down, he's not on any medication at all now, or hasn't been for a long, long time. He's not opposed to medication when it's used in the right amount at the right time for the right condition, right? His resting heart rate's 48 beats a minute. His blood sugar's down to normal. 
and his moods much higher. So if you like, he's turned the tables backwards, right? And where is he now and what's his fate? Well, that was me. <laughs> That's why they dragged me up here. You know, they wheeled me in to say, hey, are you done a bit of this stuff? But that was me, and I was in a terrible state, and right at the end of all that there, I made a massive attempt, a serious attempt to do myself in, because I was so depressed, so full of anxiety, so full of guilt, and so full of remorse, right? I just didn't know what to do with myself. Not only was I hurting myself, but all the people around me were powerless to help me, you know? And I tried absolutely everything. I'm not a bad person. And every time I went to my health professional, they would try a new technique. They'd try and shock me into it. Now the thing about it is, all my behavior was driven by fear. It was driven by emotional sensitivity and emotional insecurity, right? And every time somebody tried to shock me into it, it drove me more quickly to the behavior, do you see what I mean? So I feel that addictive behavior, including alcoholism, drug taking, gambling, all those things, are all to do with emotional sensitivity and emotional immaturity. And we talk about person-centered care. We're trying to put more and more responsibility back onto the patient now because, you know, I suppose when you get to a certain age, if you can make your own choices, then you are responsible for the choices and the consequences of those choices. But it's how you get that across to a person that's important, you know. And I know now that, you know, to come away from this victim consciousness into a more empowered state, it takes time, it takes compassion, it takes sensitivity, and it takes questioning in a certain way. Because to me, education, the Latin educere, see I'm off on black to the moment, <laughs> it means to draw out of or to lead out of. And I don't feel that you can actually empower somebody else. I think that you can facilitate an environment where they make the choices that gives them more empowerment. Do you see what I mean? So if we, if we not making it easier for somebody and doing what they need to do for themselves, but it's encouraging the fearful and it's sometimes knocking down the arrogant ones who think that they've got to talk to. If you share your honest experience with people, right, something happens at a deeper level. There's almost like a, a recognition that I'm no longer alone here. You know what I mean? Because when I first heard people talking about things, I think they must have, my mother must have told them what I'm behaving like, you see. But they were sharing their personal lived experiences. And that's why I love these conferences here, because it's based on real. I call it raw authentic and raw some lifestyle, you know what I mean? Because it's real, it's rough, it's in your face, it's honest, it's truthfulness, you know. So that's what I'm doing now, you know, so mindfulness, it's about stress free education. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to whiz through these slides. Please have a look at the PowerPoint when it goes up. Um, but I just want to show you some physiology because to me, it's all about restoring coherence at the level of the heart. Because we think that the brain is the greatest oscillator, but in fact the heart is a much greater oscillator. And we've sort of given the head a more important place. My feeling is that if you can change your breathing, we change the way the heart works. I'm going to show you that now. If we change the way the heart works, then the signals going back to the brain change, right? And then when we're in a calm and cool and collected state, we can make much more um, informed decisions, if you like. So this is about making space. But it means taking time out. You know, it means taking, it means taking a step back and rethinking. But if you're in stress and your automatic response is to go forward and get stuff done, right, then you can never find that space. And I was on that treadmill for a long time, years and years of stress, anxiety, leading to depression, and then leading to suicidal ideation and stuff like that. So, this is just the, the neuroscience of it, really. And all those inputs there on the left-hand side, they'll affect the way that your central nervous system interprets information. That will then send information via what's called the autonomic nervous system to the sinoatrial node of your heart, and it will put out this pattern here. So really, the, the HRV pattern represents your emotional processing and how you process information. What can we change? Well, the only things that we can change on there are our respiration and our emotional state. So if you can bring in a positive emotion and breathe at around six breaths per minute, okay, you change the way your HRV pattern works, 
Therefore, you change the signal that comes out at the level of the heart, and then everything changes from there. This is my personal lived experience. Will it work for you? Will it work for your patients? I don't know. You'll have to try it and see if it works. But what I do is I prescribe patients breathing techniques because I'm, I'm qualified to do that as a sports therapist, actually. Um, I show them different breathing techniques. And normally people breathe at rest about 12 to 15 breaths per minute. I help them down to nine breaths per minute and then down to six breaths per minute. And you'll notice that some of the old techniques of movement, well, this one, for example, where we move like this and we move from there like that, you might have seen people doing this, and then starting to move like this. The other way, not as nothing. <laughs> but they're all moving very, very gently and very slowly. But as you're moving in Tai Chi, for example, you're breathing in and you're breathing out around about six breaths per minute. So 3,000 years ago, they had some idea of, that this helped, you know. So what we've done is in the last 200 years is we're just catching up now. Really. Okay. So just to go to that there, we change the HRV pattern by changing our breathing and changing our mood state. So the most important thing about it is heart rate variability biofeedback. The slight difference in the interbeat interval gives an indication of how we're emotionally processing information. That's somebody's interbeat interval over five minutes um, in, the, in the state of psychological stress. And that's what happens is, don't worry too much about this, this is a scattered power um, equation to show how there's all sorts of things happening emotionally right across the board. But this is somebody who's grieving, this was me actually, at five breaths per minute. This is the way my heart was working. So on inspiration, the heart rate goes up. On breathing out, the heart rate comes down. If you practice this for three 10 minutes a day, this is what I suggest to people, for 90 days, then what starts to happen is the way you emotionally process information and are able to disengage from um, reactivity, the better choices you make. And this is basically saving my life. And so that's what happens is all the power then comes into one peak. Don't worry too much about this, sir. I've put some references on the back where you can find this information. So this is just a powerful effect on what's called heart rate variability. To use technical terms, those lumps, right, that's the technical term for <laughs> Those lumps are the way your heart acts at certain um, breaths. The small one is 12 breaths per minute. When you move then down to nine breaths per minute, you can see that the mountain is getting bigger. Okay. At six breaths per minute, what happens is your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous systems work harmoniously with one another. So it increases, uh, well, don't worry about the terms, but it increases the focus really on how your brain works as well. That's all I've got to say. This is happy looking fellow, so he's a bit younger there, but um, you know, just to say that this happened a long time ago. I've lost weight. People think that this is to do with fat. This is a Buddha belly. Or <laughs> oh, that's what I'm saying. I felt like an ectopic beat when they came in. You know? With all you slim people, I thought they're all looking at me belly, you know what I mean? But the thing about it is, something that you learn in this as well, is that most people in the West don't breathe properly. We breathe clavicularly, you know? And when we're supposed to breathe, what's supposed to happen is this, Most people breathe like this, and they suck their breath in woods. You can see them, you know when you're going down the mall, is it called the mall? It's probably called the mall in Manchester. But when, you go, when you're going down the mall, you know, you see somebody you know. Hello, Charlie, how are you? I'm looking well. And so the point is, you know, we're always trying to change our physi physiology, but maybe we're doing it the wrong way around, you know. So, I don't know whether that's made any sense, but, um, I've put some information on there about it, and I've put some references on um, The NHS, right, on the NHS websites, they do talk about stress, anxiety, depression, and stuff like this, and mindfulness as well. I would hear these techniques, these non-medical interventions, and immediately my mind would block me off from them. Sure, that can't work. Where's the proof, right? And I, I've written an article now, it's in the Journal of Anecdotal Medicine, right? It was a big, it was a big study. N equals one, right, <laughs> me.
I am my own evidence now, you know. And the reason I'm so sort of enthusiastic about this is I know that it works. And what I was actually doing is I was expecting too much. I was looking outwards for the answers. And really I've gone from expect to inspect, you know. So I'm sort of tuned in now. I use my left ear to tune into here and to focus on the breathing. And I can almost tell now when the body's processing something that's threatening to it. And most of that processing is going on below the level of my conscious mind. It just, I don't know whether this is making sense of it, but um, the idea is, well, how do I practice it? You don't need any special gear, right? All you need is a nice quiet place, right? If you just put your hands on your heart like this, right? I know it sounds a bit like put your hands on your heart, you know. Put your hands on your heart, just feel here, and just imagine that you're breathing a positive emotion, some sort of caring feeling. And in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five. Three ten-minute sessions a day for 90 days. I swear to you, it will help you, it will help your patients, it's helped thousands of people, you know. And um, I just hope that we can sort of understand that sometimes you can change the way your body works to change the way that your mind works to make better choices. You know? Well, there you are, you're done. And thank you so much for um, you know, inviting me to come along and I hope that you've got something from me. Thank you. We've got health professionals here who've trodden the path, if you like. We've got patients who've come along to share their personal lived experiences. And um, to me, it's just about sharing information, not just information that works, but also information that doesn't work as well because people can get a more sort of general idea then of other people's progress and things like that. Well, because I've sort of trodden the path myself and come from one end to the other, you know, um, I've been through the process. So what I tend to do is share my personal lived experience in an, in an open and honest way, uh, as far as I can remember. And it's that that seems to resonate with people. It's a, it's a real life tale, you know, from a health professional who's actually been on the same journey as other people, you know. So I'm proud that what was seemingly a negative experience has turned around now and become something positive and helpful for other people. Become aware of your breathing. I think because if you can reconnect with your body and the signals that your body's sending you, right, and you actually pay attention, I think the body's much more intelligent, you know, heart intelligence and body intelligence. And if we can listen in to what we're being sort of guided towards, then if you're listening to that then, you can make healthier choices and your life improves.